Welcome to St. Mary's University and to this event that's co-sponsored by the Center for the Social Scientific Study of the Bible as well as the Center for the Study of Apocalyptic and Millenarian Movements. Today we are very honored to have uh, Professor Paula Fredrickson here to deliver a lecture on her new book, When Christians Were Jews. Professor Fredrickson is Aurelio Professor of Scripture Emerita at Boston University. She's currently located in the Faculty of Humanities at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She is the author of From Jesus to Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, Augustine and the Jews, Sin, the Early History of an Idea, and most recently, Paul, the Pagan's Apostle. Most recently, other than her other most recent book, which is the one she's discussing tonight. After uh, Professor Fredrickson's lecture, we'll also have a response from Professor James Crossley, and then after that we'll have question and answers. We'll also, uh, also want to welcome the people who are live streaming this, uh, and we will be monitoring the questions uh, in the comments, so during the question and answer session, if the, those of you watching online want to ask a question, you'll have the opportunity to do so as well. For those of you who are here in the room, as a little housekeeping issue, in the event that you need the toilet, you go out this door, down the first flight of stairs, down the second flight of stairs, and they're on your left. For those of you who are watching from your house, you can go wherever you would like. <laughs> With that being said, I'd like to welcome Professor uh, Fredrickson and also just say thank you so much. We're very, very honored for you to be here with us. And thank, thank all of you for being indoors on such a beautiful, beautiful spring afternoon. I'll try to make it as enjoyable as I can, even though I don't have daffodils on me, and there are so many daffodils that are out on the lawn. I wrote this book kind of by accident. I wanted to write a book about the community that forms around the memory of the mission and message of Jesus. And what happened is that the Apostle Paul, has, has any of you read Paul's letters? He's got a pretty strong personality. Um, I wanted to write this book about Jerusalem. I live in Jerusalem. It's, uh, if you have even a teaspoon of a romantic imagination, um, which helps if you write history. Um, being in the city itself really got me geared up for writing a book about the community around uh, Jesus from what was his last Passover uh, in the city uh, to the destruction of the city 40 years later by uh, Roman troops under Titus, who was the son of the then Emperor Vespasian. And what happened is that Paul, there, there are seats right in front, or? On the side, or um, what places when Jews? yes, I hope so. <laughs> uh, either, otherwise, we're both in the wrong room. Uh, but everybody's being so polite, I have no idea. Okay. Um, Paul wouldn't let me write the book. He has a very strong personality, and if if, if you've ever worked on him or even just read his letters, he has a tendency to demand all your attention. Or as one of my students once put it, Paul sucks all the air out of the room. So I, I started out and I kept trying to talk about Peter and trying to talk about James and trying to work on this uh, first community. And Paul kept saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. So I ended up writing Paul the Pagan's Apostle first. And then what happened once I finally got that project done, uh, that took about five years, is that um, I had all this leftover research that was the abandoned project, this book, and it, it all came out at once. I wrote, it, um, I wrote it in a year, and my husband was very happy about that because he was very tired of me being in front of the monitor writing books. Welcome, thank you. The result is that this this book really is a story, and it has a narrative arc. And the narrative arc begins, could somebody shut the door? Thank you so much. Um, it, 
It begins with a moment of high drama, which is the crucifixion. And uh, it ends with the destruction of the city, which is another moment of high drama. My sources for this, beyond Paul's letters, which are very, very valuable because of all the New Testament information that we have, Paul's letters are the only sources that come from the period before the destruction of the temple. Everything else, the Gospels, and certainly the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, are written post-70, which means that those sources are, those later sources are burdened with the knowledge of trying to explain how the only temple to the only true God there are lots of other gods who are also social actors in this story, but how, how God could let his temple be destroyed. It was a, it was a tremendous uh, difficulty, and the gospel writers come up with explanations for that. Paul doesn't know that the temple is going to be destroyed. He has the innocence of the future that I try to imagine I have when I'm trying to reconstruct the, the lives of ancient people. We are looking back on their lives, we know how their story ends. There's something intrinsically tragic about doing history because you see people living their lives forward and you know how it's, going to, how it's going to end. I tried to not know that as I reconstructed the experience of this community because one of the, despite the darkness of the two narrative parentheses, the, a, a violent death and then another violent death, a violent death of a whole city. This was a period of tremendous optimism and conviction that history was, this is, this is the cheery uh, side of apocalyptic thought, that, that history was going to sum up in a positive way, that as Paul says, that the Messiah is who has been crucified and raised is about to come back and affect the signature miracle of the kingdom of God, which is the resurrection of the dead. So how all of this story gets put together, using, the, using everything I could from the New Testament, and then I had a special source, and I'm sure some of you have heard of this person, the work of Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, contemporary with the Gospel writers, who was an eyewitness to the siege of Jerusalem. So he's completely independent of the, uh, the New Testament sources. And by putting all of this together, I was able to get some critical traction up these, uh, up these the slopes, the slippery slopes of these sources, and, um, and try to present in a fresh and energetic way the convictions that animated this, this community. One of the reasons the community is in Jerusalem, despite the execution of its leader, is because they are expecting the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God as an historical event in late Second Temple Judaism occurs, those of you who are familiar with the book of Isaiah know this, that it's Jerusalem is the um, is the epicenter for the kingdom of God. Isaiah has uh, beautiful, excuse me, uh, gin. Well, cheers. Isaiah talks about all of the nations streaming to Jerusalem when God's kingdom is established and the reassembling of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you get a global population represented in God's kingdom. 70 Gentile nations, the number 70 nations come from the descendants of Noah in Genesis 10, his three sons, and eventually you get a list of 70 different nations. And then all 12 tribes, which corresponds to the 12 tribes that were the plenum of Israel during the Davidic kingdom, the resonances between messianic traditions and, um, and the kingdom, uh, the final Davidic Messiah and, the, and David, of the lineage of David. So my first question was, 
why does Jesus and how does Jesus end up killed for this particular Passover if we go with the Gospel of John. He went up to Jerusalem multiple times. This is where the story becomes a tale of two cities. This is a story not only about Jerusalem, it's a story about Rome. The Jerusalem that Jesus knew was a city that was built by Herod the Great. And Herod the Great had a very positive relationship with Augustus, the first, the first Roman emperor. There's a saying that uh, Augustus discovered Rome made of red brick and left it made of marble. And a similar thing can be said of Herod. It's something of an irony given that Rome destroys Jerusalem. We're all familiar with the Arch of Titus, the picture of the, the spoils from the temple being, being marched in the triumph in Rome. But Rome also built Jerusalem because of this positive political synergy between Herod the Great and Augustus. So Jerusalem is one of the richest and most marvelous cities, and it's a, a location of Jewish pilgrimage. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a number of, at least three uh, cycles of annual holidays around Passover. He was also up for Sukkot. He's up for some unnamed holidays. He's in and out of Jerusalem a lot. And this, thinking with the chronology that we have in John, helped me to figure out one of the great mysteries of New Testament scholarship. Why was Jesus crucified, killed as if Pilate thought he was a political insurrectionist? Why was Jesus crucified if his followers were not? Why is it that, because the Romans didn't do half measures when it came to suppressing people they thought were rebels. They took care of the whole movement. There are multiple crucifixions. There are lots of Roman slaughters of popular messianic movements and apocalyptic prophets, uh, prophets getting popular followings. It's an anomaly to have Jesus killed by himself as if Pilate thought he was an insurrectionist, when clearly if Peter and James and the other apostles and other members of the community not only are not rounded up by Rome, but they settle back in Jerusalem in a very short time after the execution of their follower, not being worried about the chief priests and not being worried about Rome. So there are bits of the story that the story's very familiarity works against trying to figure out what's going on historically because we all know Jesus ends up on a cross, but he shouldn't have if Pilate knew that he wasn't leading a dangerous movement. The Gospel's explanation, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's explanation for how Jesus ends up on a cross is because of the scene in the temple where Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers and, um, and complains about those who sold and says, You're, you've, made my, um, you've made the temple into a den of the word actually means insurrectionists. You've, you've made it into a den of, of bandits. This was another anomaly in the evidence. That story occurs toward the end of the Gospel of Mark, our earliest gospel. And it's, it's the plot device that gets, you know, it's the Pharisees who have been the bad guys throughout Jesus' uh, public mission, and suddenly the baton is passed and then the priests enter the stage. And it's because of the scene in the temple that that is what brings about the denouement of the synoptic gospels. The priests are alienated and then the priests somehow or other get Pilate to do their will. Priestly agency in the death of Jesus is an important way that the gospel writers who are writing after the destruction of the temple explain why the temple is destroyed. It's, it's a punishment of the priests who are naturally particularly associated with the temple. The anomaly, 
was that the Gospel of John uses that story in chapter 2. Jesus overturns, uh, drives out those who sold in chapter 2, which means that the incident in the Gospel of John has nothing to do with the explanation for how, why Jesus dies and the resolution of the story. So there's this blip in the evidence. It can't, he can't have done it both at the very beginning of his, his ministry and at the very end of his ministry, what's going on. What I turn to is traditions about the temple and the focus on pilgrimage and that is exactly when the Romans would have marched up from the coast where they were garrisoned and been in Jerusalem explicitly for the high holidays. If I bracketed out that floating story, what kind of, what kind of propulsion did I have for explaining why Jesus ends up on the cross? Here I, I want to ask you to think with the idea of the triumphal entry. That is a public proclamation of Davidic, messianic, apocalyptic hope, where you have this image of Jesus. And, and here's this weekend coming up, right? Next weekend. Um, it's, it's no coincidence that Easter and Passover come together, right? If Jesus is publicly acclaimed by excited pilgrims that he has something to do with a messianic kingdom, if people are proclaiming Jesus as the inaugurator of this kingdom, that is something that Pilate and the priests will both have to pay attention to because both Pilate and the priests are responsible for keeping the peace. But why, if Jesus had been up to Jerusalem multiple times, would this Passover have been different? And that's where drawing on um, the sort of uh, Theory that theories that uh, the Center for uh, the Study of Apocalyptic Movements concentrates on. I think that Jesus might have named this particular Passover as the final Passover before the kingdom comes. That's the only thing I could think of that would explain why this Passover would be different. Why does somebody get crucified by Rome? Because they're popular. If Pilate were not concerned about controlling an enthusiastic crowd. He could have killed, he could have just arrested Jesus. He wouldn't have had to have bothered with, with Jesus. The point of crucifixion is crowd control. It is a demonstration of the coercive power of the state. The only reason to do that kind of crowd control is because the crowd is declaring Jesus the Messiah. And what happens instead is that Jesus, according to the traditions we have, is ambushed at night. Why at night? Precisely because he's so popular. And he ends up on a cross very shortly thereafter. But then we have the traditions of the resurrection. The native home of traditions about the resurrection of the dead is apocalyptic Jewish hope. The fact that Jesus' followers had this experience means that they were geared up for an apocalyptic miracle. The one they were expecting was the kingdom. What they got was the, appear the reappearances of their leader. So all of this is working with apocalyptic hope. And then I started paying attention to something else in the evidence. Jesus' appearances to his apostles begin to taper off, and then they stop. In the Acts of the Apostles, Jesus uh, stays around for 40 days and then ascends into heaven, and then he, his voice will uh, come back on stage when, uh, during Paul's conversion experiences. But in fact, taking that as some kind of subterranean historical report, what that means is that the community which moves back to Jerusalem, probably because it's expecting Jerusalem to be the site of the coming kingdom, has to explain what it's supposed to do. 
once the resurrection appearances stop. This is where Christianity, what will become Christianity, makes its great contribution to different Jewish traditions of Messianism. According to this particular movement, the Messiah has to come not once, but twice. After the resurrection appearances taper off, it means Jesus will have to come back to establish the kingdom. What's the community to do in the meanwhile? Here's where I had a very practical thought. It's harder to wait and do nothing than to wait and do something. At least that's true for me. I twitch if I'm not doing anything. This community had to decide what to do while it was waiting for Christ to come back. And what it decides to do is take the message out to Israel of the diaspora. In first century Judea, the diaspora would involve Jews with two different populations, the human population and the divine population. Gods in Mediterranean antiquity are very local. The Jewish God was the God who lived in Jerusalem. But the god Augustus, for example, lived in Caesarea, which is where the Roman troops were garrisoned. Foreign gods, the diaspora, in a sense, begins on the coastline of Judea. Once members of this movement went to diaspora synagogues, they encountered not only Jews in those synagogues, but also pagans who showed up in synagogues as well. These were people who continued to worship their native gods, but also were showing respect for the God of Israel. And when this movement charges through the synagogue communities, interested pagans begin to want to associate with the movement as well. This was a contingency that the movement wasn't, per I mean, think about, think about the Jesus movies you've all seen. Jesus doesn't bump into that many pagans when he's in the Galilee, or for that matter, in Judea. The only prominent pagan Jesus bumps into is Pilate, and that does not go very well. But these pagans begin to get interested in the movement, and it's at that point that the apostles have to deal with hostile pagan gods. This was another thing that jumped out at me from the evidence. Paul, who's a Jewish monotheist, complains about pagan gods. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the minds of unbelievers. He talks about the returning Christ conquering astral and planetary forces. He talks about pagan gods bending knees above, knees above the earth, upon the earth, and below the earth. Those are a lot of superhuman knees. So the pop, not only is the human population going to acknowledge the returning Christ, according to Paul, so are pagan gods. One of the most important pagan gods in the first century is the Roman emperor. Herod built temples not only to the Jewish god, he also built temples to Augustus because Augustus was considered a god. So was Caligula, another emperor. You know, if Herod's the king, everybody loves to hate. Caligula's the emperor, everybody loves to hate. Caligula, in 3940, decided that he was going to put a statue of Zeus combined with his own features to bring the cult of the Roman emperor into the Jerusalem temple. The Acts of the Apostles says nothing about this which is amazing because it was, according to Josephus, according to another contemporary Jewish writer, Philo, this was a massive trauma. I mean, it was, if you think about uh, the Maccabean revolt breaking out because of an earlier attempt, two centuries uh, previous to this period, 
the Jew, only the Jewish God is allowed to be worshipped in the Jerusalem temple. So it, this is the social and religious equivalent of bringing matter and antimatter together. Caligula's statue is being rolled down the coast road. It gets as far as the, as the Galilee. This is one of the great cliffhangers of uh, first century literature. Petronius, who is the Roman uh, legate in charge of getting the statue to Jerusalem, is met by a sit-down strike of the entire country, um, where Josephus says men, women, and children are sitting down in front of the statue, insisting that he stop. Meanwhile, Roman aristocrats are nudging him and saying, this really isn't a good idea. You can't do this. And Petronius writes an email to Augustus and says, why don't you stop this before there's some kind of revolt? And Caligula writes back to Petronius and says, thank you for your th sharing your thoughts. Please kill yourself. He probably didn't say please. <laughs> but Caligula is assassinated shortly. This, this is about chaos, death, and confusion. All right. Um, Caligula is assassinated shortly after he writes the letter to Petronius. A second letter to Petronius from the Roman Senate gets sent. The first letter wanders, probably because it was using the Israeli postal system. The, the second letter gets to Petronius first, informing Petronius that Caligula um, has been assassinated. And Several weeks thereafter, he gets the first letter telling him to commit to it, telling him to kill himself, and he decides not to do that. Coincidence? I think not. Josephus says, well, see that this shows that Petronius is right. But what that means is that the community in Jerusalem had a ringside seat in the year 40 for something that was traditionally it, an idea that was an, an apocalyptic um, trigger. Again, the, the idea of the abomination of desolation standing where it, where it ought not be. Another confirmation of the community that it really, they did know what time it was on God's clock. The community continues to live in uh, Jerusalem and they're getting another validation and confirmation that they know what time it is on God's clock because pagans are hearing about the gospel and they are voluntarily abandoning the worship of their own gods and making an exclusive commitment to the God of Israel, just like Isaiah had said they would at the apocalyptic end time. The Jesus movement is not the only messianic movement in first century Judea. There are other movements of people who want to be kings, as Josephus says, and king is a Greek word for Messiah. Rome keeps putting them down. Finally, there's an open revolt when a son of a, a chief priest stops sacrificing for the well-being of the empire and the emperor in Jerusalem's altar, and the whole country breaks out into revolt. Josephus, who's a 28-year-old man who had been a priest in the temple, is sent to the Galil to defend the north because the Romans are going to come down from Antioch and begin the conquest of the country that way. He's defending a city called Yodfat. Vespasian is, surrounds the city. Vespasian conquers the city. and. Josephus goes before Vespasian. You don't want to go up against the Roman army in the first century. And it's at that moment that Josephus has a prophecy. And he looks at Vespasian. Nero, another emperor everybody loves to hate, Nero is now emperor. And Josephus looks at Vespasian and says, you are going to be emperor, and so will your son after you. And because of that prophecy, Vespasian spares Josephus' life, which is a good thing because without Josephus' two writings, I don't know how I would have done the book. Mm -hmm. 
It's after that point that Josephus serves as a translator for Vespasian and for Titus, who are pressing on with the siege of Jerusalem. Josephus is serving as a translator. He's standing at the walls of the city, pleading with the people inside the city to, to surrender. Meanwhile, inside the city, having just been through the Israeli elections, I can picture this without difficulty, the city itself is divided into three factions, and the factions are killing each other, while the Romans are outside the gates of the city. And finally, Titus wins the war. But because there's a change in dynasty, Nero is dead. His father Vespasian is now emperor, just like Josephus said it would happen. And Titus has to make an example of Jerusalem as a way to establish the power and credibility and legitimacy of a new imperial dynasty. And it's because of that political necessity to make it's the urban equivalent of a crucifixion, right? A total, Romans did not like to destroy God's temples because all gods exist in antiquity and nobody wants an angry god on their back. Romans were very respectful of other people's temples. This temple had to be made an example of. And so the entire city is, is destroyed and the temple itself is destroyed. Within the city, is the original community around Jesus. There's later fourth century traditions that that community had fled before the destruction of the city. I think that's exactly what that is, is a much later tradition. The city itself is pulled down and there's a sense in which the apocalyptic prophecy of this generation was right, but the apocalypse was initiated, not by God, but by Titus. The movement survives in the diaspora and in the Galil, but Jerusalem itself is the smoking epicenter of this messianic, the, the destructiveness of the messianic conviction brushing up against Roman power politics. Josephus says, and I think I have the quotation. I do, I do, hold on. When Josephus is explaining why his countrymen went to war, he says, what more than all else incited them to war was an ambiguous oracle found in their sacred scriptures to the effect that at that time, one from their own country would become the ruler of the whole world. This they understood to be someone of their own household and many of their wise men went astray in their interpretation of it. That's from the Jewish War, Book 6. But Josephus knew that that, that prophecy about a world ruler was not about the Messiah. It was about Vespasian. That same prophecy is one of the final notes sounded in Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 15, where he talks about the root of Yeshai, David's father, will, will come. He who rises to rule the, the nations, and him will the nations hope. In other words, we have a match between where Paul ends his last letter, probably, that we have from him, the epistle to the Romans, and the prophecy that Josephus mentions itself. It's within this charged context in Jerusalem that we have all of these elements that we have domesticated in the later gospel narratives. And that's the story about when Christians were Jews between the years 30 and 70 in Jerusalem. James? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Paula. And as ever with Paula's work, I find myself in broad agreement, certainly with her agenda, her historicizing preferences, and what she does with first century history, eschatology, and notions of Jewishness. 
Paula takes eschatology, apocalypticism, millenarianism, and so on seriously, by which I mean she keeps its sting and does not reduce such ideas to mere metaphor, as in some apologetic scholarship which uses apocalypticism to bash other agendas, while not taking the oddness of apocalypticism at all seriously. Kind of the decaffeinated apocalypticism of N.T. Wright, for instance. Uh, it's uncalled for. I'm better than that. Um, I'm not. Uh, I have two colleagues who say seemingly different things on apocalypticism. One of them is here today. Um, one says, let's make apocalypticism crazy again. And one says, let's make apocalypticism boring again. And I think they're both right. <laughs> English compromise. And by this I mean, uh, let's take seriously the idea that apocalypticism is alien to most academic settings while not losing sight that it can be a vehicle for talking about regular cultural concerns in a given context and may, in that setting, not be uh, unusual at all. I think Paul, uh, as ever, strikes this balance just right. I think it is linked to her assumptions also about Jewishness and Judaism in the first century, which, takes seri which uh, she takes seriously without being deferential to the range of ways people identified themselves and were identified by others, and without using phrases common in scholarship like very Jewish or constructing a positive but convenient Ju Judaism as a duplicitous way of making Jesus better. Again, CNT right, um, who epitomises me. He's not the only offender there, of course. Everyone else is. Uh, in, in this, Paula has been a rare exception in New Testament scholarship for, uh, for years. Uh, and I'm not just being nice because she's here. I've actually said this in print and publicly before, so you know, there's no duplicitous writing kind of agenda here. Oh, God. Um, being filmed. Uh, th there are other issues which I'd push further still. If I had time, and I really wanted to talk about this, but time constraints of time was a problem. If I had time, I would have liked to have talked about the links between a leader of a millenarian movement and perceptions of political violence. I think there's a lot to discuss there, and I think Paul has hit on something. But here I want to develop further the significance uh, of the Caligula crisis in the history of early Christian, or whatever term you want to use, eschatological thought, though I appreciate Paul had the constraints of space too in the book. Nevertheless, Part of the idea of response is to provoke further debate. So here it goes. This is more pushing the idea a bit further rather than um, an actual critique at this point. As Paula notes, the Caligula crisis, when Caligula was due to put this image of himself in the Jerusalem temple, had some influence on the ways end times were understood in the light of the book of Daniel. Perhaps even influencing, if I read Paula's comments on page 166 correctly, perhaps influencing Mark's gospel. Although she reads Mark 13 primarily in the light of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem, I, I think. But I think the evidence for the combination of the Caligula crisis and the book of Daniel is, and I think that Paul hinted at this, uh, is quite strong in Mark 13, whatever we make of the final form of Mark 13. The most obvious indication is the prediction of the abomination of the desolation in chapter 13, verse 14. The English rendering of the Greek phrase, uh, abomination of the desolation, the Greek is tabedologma uh, tes eremoseus, is probably accurate enough in the sense that it does mean that it's something unholy, idolatrous, and in some senses causes d desolation or destruction. But the combination of the two words in Mark 13, verse 14, is, as Paula notes, a reference back to Daniel, in Daniel 9, chapter 9, 11, and 12, which likewise references a foreign cult being established in the temple under Antiochus IV. Probably the dominant reading of Daniel in the first century was to understand the prophecies in light of Rome. But the understanding of Daniel in light of Antiochus' actions was not actually forgotten either. Jerome, for instance, later on is aware of readings of Daniel in the context of the Maccabean crisis and believed that a statue of Zeus Olympius was erected in the temple. It also looks likely that a similar view was known to Porphyry, who apparently interpreted Daniel 12, verse 12, in something like the following way. Uh, 45 days beyond the 1,290 signify the interval of victory over the generals of Antiochus, or the period when Judas Maccabeus fought with bravery and cleansed the temple and broke the idol to pieces, offering blood sacrifices to God. 
There is the possibility, too, that uh, Mark may be aware of reading Daniel in light of the Maccabean crisis, just as the Caligula crisis was understood to be a new Maccabean crisis. All this stuff is all mixed up together in popular thought, I think. So after the abomination is set up in verse 14, those who in Judea must flee to the mountains, echoes the story in 1 Maccabees 2 verse 28. Then he, Matthias, and his sons fled to the hills. Be that as, may, be that as it may, the real point here is that the, this tradition understood the phrase, the abomination of desolation, as referring to something idolatrous set up in the temple. The early external interpretation of Daniel's prophecy of the abomination of the desolation is in 1 Maccabees uh, chapter 1, verse 54, which likewise talks of the desolating sacrilege, more or less the same Greek phrase, erected on the altar of burnt offering under Antiochus. Now anyone familiar with this phrase and its interpretive background will be well aware that it was a prophecy referring to something idolatrous placed in the temple akin to what Antiochus did. And I think by far the closest fit in the first century is the Caligula crisis. Indeed, Mark 13 verse 14 hints further at the abomination being a statue of Caligula. But when you see the abomination of the desolation set up where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the hills. The English doesn't convey the oddity of the Greek here, which uses a masculine participle standing, despite referring to a neuter abomination. So see, it could be something like, so when you see it standing where he ought not to be. It's a deliberately confused Greek phrasing. Now there's much more to be said about this. But I would go along with um, certain arguments, computers, you know, with certain arguments that uh, uh, claim that the Caligula crisis is where ideas about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of he coming with the clouds of heaven enters the gospel tradition. Like much of Mark 13, it's distinctively different to the eschatological teaching of Jesus elsewhere, which is about the kingdom of God. They're not paired up, interestingly. Uh, but that the Caligula crisis. Um, played a significant role in the first century. My computer's updating. No. Sorry, my computer just started to do an update. That was, uh, where were we? Okay, that, um, but the Caligula crisis played a significant role in the first century eschatology. Uh, is significant, I think, is important. Tacitus suggests that there was an expectation in Judea that another Roman emperor would do exactly what Caligula tried. So this combination of Antiochus, Daniel, Caligula was almost certainly crucial in framing eschatology, as Paula rightly stresses, in the decades after Jesus' death. This helps us partly understand why the prophecy of end times could continue to be seen as relevant and potentially reused. Was it not obvious that Rome would do this once again? Now, of course, part of the expectations of a response is to give a bit of pushback. Uh, and in this case... Um, like whenever I do have disagreements with Paul, or it's usually on issues of details and specifics rather than the big picture stuff. And what I want to do now is to suggest an alternative reading of the early part of the Passion narrative, particularly the so-called triumphal entry and the so-called cleansing of the temple in Mark 11. I strongly agree with Paul that there is no good evidence whatsoever that the earliest perceptions of Jesus, or indeed John the Baptist, had them in opposition to the temple, or at least the ideal function of the temple. I, don't think, I think that's an apologetic invention, frankly. But what I, where I would challenge Paul is on perhaps some of the details and give an alternative reading and see what we make of that. Paul is sceptical about the historicity of the so-called cleansing of the temple, and she suggests that uh, the lestai should be understood as revolutionaries, though I noticed the term bandits came up in the previous talk. And so we should be thinking of a translation, you have turned the temple into a hiding place for revolutionaries. Uh, and as, this, as with this episode as a whole, this makes little historical sense in terms of the historical Jesus. So the argument goes. Similarly, Mark is untroubled by realism, where he claims that Jesus would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Such an action would require an army to implement. Now, I don't know how to prove or disprove the historicity of, of Jesus' temple act. Uh, and I'm not going to try and do that here, and I don't, uh, and I just simply, I'm, I'm very sceptical about how we can do this thing one way or another. But I do wonder if it's possible to see it um, 
more coherent in the sense that it fits with early perceptions of, G of a Jesus who was not opposed to the temple's ideal function, but did dispute some of the ways it was being run. This passage is not about protesting sacrifices, but I think the passage could be seen as a critique of how sacrifices were being run, how the sacrificial system was being run, and for the action perhaps being less dramatic than it's often seen. Given the context focuses on dove sellers and money changers, I think we should take seriously that this action is understood as an economic critique, and Paula does discuss some of this. Uh, she shows this with reference to the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Essenes, that there was a tradition of perceived economic exploitation by those running the temple. And to this, uh, there, are there are others, I think, perhaps beyond the Essenes as well, who were critics of the way the temple was being run, such as Judas and Matthias's opposition to the Golden Eagle, in the temple, a critique of priests extracting tithes from the poor, or the first century authority Simeon ben Gamaliel, who was less dramatic but still critical of the price of doves being too expensive and thus poor people would not be able to afford them. In this context, Jesus' reference to Isaiah 56 and the ideal function of the temple as a house of prayer, including sacrifices, as Paul notes, is significant, but so too is the reference to Jeremiah 7 and the den of, well, what? Revolutionaries is, of course, one possibility. But I think Les uh, can have a range of nuances and it can mean bandits, whether in the sort of pre-political sense Eric Hobsbawm famously described, to something like, almost like mob bosses or simply old school robbers of the sort mentioned in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So Jeremiah 7, which refers to, the issue, to issues of exploitation by those running the temple, could make sense as a polemic here. But what about not allowing anyone to carry anything through? Um, perhaps more precisely, it's a vessel Jesus prohibits. And we might turn to the argument that this is presented as a legal decision made by Jesus, extending the prohibition of carrying vessels in the inner sanctuary to the temple more broadly understood perhaps those containing sacrificial animals or joints of them, which would have upped the cost for those who couldn't afford them. This logic was not to prevent sacrifices, but in fact to make sacrifices easier for poorer people. Quite literally how we take the idea of Jesus not allowing anyone to carry anything or a vessel, uh, I, I'm, not so, I'm not sure. This could simply be more of a legal decision, much like allowing plucking of the grain on the Sabbath. It doesn't challenge the Sabbath as an institution. It says, well, plucking is acceptable. His opponents say no. And these are the kind of typical sorts of debates you find in rabbinic literature, for instance. But even so, I think there's a case to see this passage uh, in Mark as something that is in keeping with early perceptions of Jesus, and not necessarily just a post-70 invention. I think the framing is certainly judgment on the temple. I mean, that's, I think that's fairly clear, but taken on it by itself, it doesn't have to be. Although it, it's perhaps judgment is implicit. I, was never, I wasn't sure what to do with the judgment on the temple, and I'm still not entirely sure what to do with it, where, how early that kind of prediction might go. And what, uh, I want to finish with another detail on the preceding passage in Mark 11, the, the triumphal entry. And Paul uh, frames this in terms of popular messianic acclaim, and in the context of this discussion, she argues that after several years of announcing the coming of the kingdom, Jesus may have shifted the time frame of his prophecy from soon to now. And Paula talked about this in, the, in, in her talk. Uh, and I, I wonder if uh, this passage in Mark 11, 1 through to 10, actually supports Paula's case, but in a different way. While the passage no doubt assumed an elevated role for Jesus, I'm not denying that, the emphasis is quite strongly, I think, on the coming kingdom. And a comparison between Mark, Matthew and Luke shows that it was Matthew and Luke who really went for the, and heightened the Christological claims. So I'll read all three passages out, and, uh, and there's some significant differences here. So from Mark 11, uh, verses 9 to 10. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our ancestor, David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. If anyone's just joined this, on, is looking at this on Facebook now, I'm giving a popular sermon. Um, Matthew's version. So, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David in Mark. Matthew's version. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Matthew 21. Luke 19. 
Uh, as he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully and with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. So very clearly from that tradition, Matthew and Luke push the Christological claims hi uh, higher. But in Mark, I think blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David is crucial to the surrounding enthusiasm and is obviously another way of talking about the imminent kingdom of God. And the crowd's reference to our father, our ancestor David here, I think is another instance of self-referencing themselves as Jews, much like similar phrases such as daughter or son of Abraham, or even in some instances, of course, son of God. I don't think there is a developed son of David Christology in Mark, and those who point to the previous passage in Mark 10, where Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus, and who refers to Jesus as the son of David, well, I'd suggest a similar answer. This could be a phrase exclaiming or valorising Jesus' ethnicity or background, and it's notable when in this particular way of referring to Jews turns up, it is fittingly in the Jerusalem area, Davidic area. But back to the point, the Markan version of the triumphal entry is clearly one where the eschatology, or eschatological rather than Christological expectation is heightened. And I think this, I mean again I can't prove how far this goes back, how early this is or anything like this, but I think this might even complement Paul's reading of Jesus last week even more where it's pushing the eschatological agenda and the others try, uh, reinterpret it in light of a Christological agenda. But they're obviously just specific criticisms of specific pages um, and I think I'd better let Paula respond. Paula hasn't had time to, um, Paula didn't know that was coming. <laughs> so, uh, so I've just sprung this on her um, by unprofessionally finishing it about two minutes before my talk. But should I give, do you want a few minutes should to, if, if, you, yeah, if you want, do you want to respond? Or? Sure. Oh, sounds ominous. Um, so. Thank you. Would you please write the second edition of my book and stick that in? I think that's right. <laughs> I mean, it's um, um, it, that the eschatological aspects of the coming kingdom, I think, are what we get a, an echo of when we look at those traditions, and it would make sense that that would be something that would uh, cue Pilate and uh, also the priests that they had to do something to quiet the crowd down. And um, um, about the uh, about the uh, what's affectionately known in the New Testament business as the temple tantrum. Um, with the uh, with turning over the the tables, it's hard to know. Um, again, because it's it's that anomalous story that floats around. I'm I'm not sure how much to uh, focus on that. What I am interested in is the is the existence of the term that's translated as robbers, leste, that I suggested as bandits. Um, that same word shows up in terms of the two people between the two men between whom Jesus is crucified. It's leste, and unfortunately, the Revised Standard Version uh, often translates that as Jesus crucified between two. Anybody? Thieves. Thieves, which has caused untold generations of undergraduates going through my classroom to think that the Romans crucified people for larceny. They didn't. They crucified, they crucified people to discourage revolt. So it's, um, again, this, this idea of, how shall I put this? Going back to Jesus and going back to the uh, triumphal entry, whatever historical, actual historical event uh, those traditions reflect, There's, there's a sense in which prophecy is politics by other means. And it's the, uh, there is no such thing as um, a politically neutral apocalyptic prophecy. And I think that's where, again, this, this combination, we tend to discern 
between a religious motivation, a political motivation, um, a personal motivation, and, and so on. And all of these things come packaged together. When Caligula wanted to put his statue in the temple, that was partly he wanted the political honor of having his, his image and the image of the high sky god, Zeus, which is one of the, one of the pagan pantheon associated normally with Yahweh. Right? It's, they're all male sky god colleagues. So that's a kind of, of um, translation. But that's, that's considered a religious insult and uh, something that spurs a political response that's embedded in traditional prophecies. So this whole, this whole bundle of things, um, this whole bundle of things comes together. If you look at this combination of politics, prophecy, and acute apocalyptic expectation all together, this this generation is like an unstable radioactive isotope with energy coming out of it. And what's uh, astonishing is the way once the, if you look at Jerusalem as the beating heart of these traditions, even once the city no longer exists, Jerusalem remains the launching pad for apocalypses. If you think of the book of Revelation, it's still a prominent place for apocalyptic, apocalyptic scenarios to be staged from. And um, living there now, I can say it still is uh, a prominent place for apocalyptic uh, scenarios to be staged from. And I told myself I wouldn't refer to the recent elections here, so I'm not going to. OK. Thank you. Should we? Uh, open this up for questions. Um, what, do you, what, what do you want to do, Chris? Yes, let's do. Um, we'll take a few from here and then. We'll take, well, so we'll take a few from here and some from online. Is that right, Chris? Sure. Yeah. Questions for Paul? Not me. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much for that. Um, I've, got about, well, I've got a lot of points, but I hope to think. Uh, first of all, let's die. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, do I start again from the beginning? No, Take no, it from no. the top? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, right, Lestai actually also means pirates because it was used uh, for all the pirates off the coast of uh, Chilicia. Yeah, right. And, and um, in, indeed in, uh, all over the Mediterranean. So it's a sort of very much a, a catch all violent person word. So right. It's, it's a violent bad guy. Really violent, yes. Yeah. Um, the second thing is uh, that um, uh, E.P. Sanders was talking about the temple disturbance. He said, in the size of the temple, nobody would have noticed it because the temple courtyard was so large and they had sort of temple police. Any disturbance like that would have been dealt with immediately. And so it was a, a very minor incident, which was obviously blown out of proportion. Um, so we, we do have a dichotomy there on, on how, how come this became a source of um, contention even with the, the temple authorities. They must have had a lot of people, uh, as they do now, who have Jerusalem madness when they visit Jerusalem and become, uh, think they are another messiah. Um, I think it's the parking situation. It makes anybody crazy. Well, yes. Right. yes. Well, well, trying to find a bit. Trying right. to find a bit. Mm. Do you want to, um, you asked two questions. One is the, the violent bad guys. Well, yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a true observation. Uh, in terms of the, um, how many people here know that children's books, Where's Waldo? Mm. This is sort of how I imagine the temple <laughs> scene. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it would have been very hard to, it would have been hard to see if you, um, I have a, an essay coming out in the Wall Street Journal on Easter weekend. And um, I asked readers to imagine being at an LL loading terminal the week before Passover with families, with screaming children, with um, incredible crowds, and Israelis don't have very strong 
um, instincts about queuing up either. And then imagine that every family has one sheep with it. And then imagine having to camp out in the terminal for a week before getting on the plane. And you, you sort of get an image of what Passover is like in Jerusalem in the days of the temple. So the, if, if there had been some kind of performance of some kind of act, Sanders, of course, takes it to be an apocalyptic prophecy of the overturned tables, meaning that a coming prophecy of, of destruction, not, a, not an economic critique. If there were something uh, that Jesus enacted at that point, um, it would have been very hard to see. It, w it just because of the crowds. The question then becomes, why does it become the grain and the pearl? Absolutely. And, and I think uh, that's because it's, um, it's mobilized to explain the passion in such a way that the people responsible for the temple that's just been destroyed are the ones who are, uh, manipulate Pilate into um, into doing what, what they, the evil priests, want to do. And, there's, and I think that's, that's how that gets foregrounded. There's a question in the back and a question up here. I see you. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, fascinating presentation. And uh, I'd like to get a book and have a read of it. Could I uh, ask, uh, uh, do you have any thoughts about the relationship between Pontius Pilate and the Jewish authorities? And why Pilate seemed a little bit reluctant to have Jesus crucified? Um, Pilate was known to have a trigger finger, not to mix modes of execution. Um, we have uh, reports about him in, uh, in Philo, who talk about his having an unfortunate habit of executing untried prisoners. Um, you, if you look at the, the outlying, uh, Tacitus actually says, and Tacitus is not a Judeophile, he accuses um, Pilate, not accuses Pilate, he comments that Pilate was not known for a light touch. So um, historians shouldn't necessarily shave with Occam's razor, but you, you, don't, you don't need to have the priests goading Pilate to have Pilate seem like the sort of person who would be very committed to crowd control. The other reason that Pilate would be very committed to keeping things quiet in Jerusalem is because he'd be fired if he didn't control. That's, his ju that's why the, the Roman governor and 3,000 Roman troops who are local Gentiles employed by Rome, they're not speaking Latin to each other. They're, they're chatting in Aramaic, but I think they have Roman soldier uniforms on. Um, that's why they come up specifically to control the crowd. I think the priests, in my movie, um, the priests are the ones who help, who say to, who say to Pilate, we can, we can get you this guy, don't hurt anybody else. And Pilate says, you got five minutes, make it, you know, get on it now. And I, that's how I see the, the priests um, operating there. And I think, again, with the tr traditions of the triumphal entry and the, the noisiness of the prophecy itself and the type of excitement it would generate, and particularly at a, at a crowded holiday like this, when, says Josephus, sedition is most likely to break out, um, I can understand why Pilate would want to decapitate the movement. He knew, I really, this is an argument too, back in the 1960s, Remember the 1960s? I do. Um, uh, there was a brilliant book by a man named Brandon called Jesus and the Zealots. And uh, it was about Jesus as an actual revolutionary. I think that there's enough traditions that even somebody as belligerent as Paul repeats about uh, Pacific, you know, honor, honor governing authorities and, and don't rock the boat and pay your taxes and be nice to each other and don't fight so much and all that other stuff. I see that as the tone. And so for Pilate knowing that Jesus is not leading a violent movement, again, explains why only Jesus 
would have been killed because what Pilate's doing is discouraging other people. Thank you for your, thank you both for your question. This gentleman in the front. My question is about the prophecies, the uh, ap apocalyptic movements of this time, mm -hmm. um, about the roots and the continuities between the different movements. Mm -hmm. I think in comparison of the 17th century, the, the literacy was crucial Yes. as a source for the movements of the 17th century. Uh, in the Commonwealth, and I think of Mecca in the beginning of the 7th century, the, those first 40 years, Bromwich's account of the, 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 the spontaneous movements which were drawing on uh, Jew, Jewish and Christian sources. What were these apocalyptic movements of the, of the pre-destruction of Jerusalem that 40 years, what were their sources? What, were the, what was, what, what was the, the means of continuity between one movement feeding another? Was it, was there, were there elements of literacy important? What do we know about these movements, their, their, their provenance? I will say first off that we know very little and then secondly I'm a trained academic so that won't prevent me from speaking. Um, <laughs> Uh, to the question. I, th I think this is why I liked the fit between Romans 15, uh, 8 or 9, I can't remember, and, um, uh, and Josephus's report of a messianic prophecy. I mean, uh, a ruler who's rising to rule the nations, uh, somebody from the house of David who rises to rule the nations, is something that is available in Jewish scripture. Um, you, have, uh, you have the Dead Sea Scroll community absolutely saturated with uh, apocalyptic commentaries on uh, classical uh, prophecies. And uh, also remember that um, Herod the Great ruled with an iron fist and an iron glove. And uh, Herod, you all know about wanting to be Herod's pig rather than Herod's son, that, that pun that's made in Greek um, by, uh, supposedly by Augustus. Herod killed his four sons who were most like himself, politically brilliant, effective, um, and probably actually plotting to overthrow their father so they could be kings. He was left with the B team, with um, the sons who were left, and in other words, there was a power vacuum after Herod, and that's when the Romans take over direct control. Uh, after they fire one of Herod's inept sons, the Romans take over control of Judea. And it's, that creates a political opportunity for people who wanted to be, who thought they had a shot at it. And Josephus refers to these people as, there are two types of messianic figures, the ones who, the men who would be king, uh, one of whom is a shepherd, and Josephus is a snobby Jerusalem aristocrat, and he sniffs, oh, he doesn't even come from the right sort of family. But why, if you're expecting a Davidic messiah, wouldn't you follow somebody who was a shepherd? Right? That was David's day job before he got his, um, a different one. So you have these, these political figures who want to be kings, and you also have what Josephus calls goetes, um, deceivers, who are people who are having um, eschatological visions. They're, they're going to split the waters of the Jordan, or they're going to um, have the, the walls of Jerusalem closed. So that you have, I think there's a kind of, and James, I'm gonna ask you to come in on this. I think there's, there are, uh, times that have temperaments, <laughs> and the and that this was this was such a time shaped partly by the political vacuum. Mm. Um, yeah, I, um, to, to pick up on the first point about um, literacy and apocalypticism, uh, 
in European apocalypticism, I think, but certainly in the first century, you get two different types in one sense. You get clearly a book of Daniels written by, for obvious reasons, written by uh, a scribal elite. Um, clearly in the first century there was a scribal elite into apocalyptic writing. That's, but also there's a, what looks like there's a, lull, um, a non-elite apocalyptic, apocalypticism. The people who follow these kinds of movements, perhaps even led these kinds of movements, who weren't necessarily um, strictly literate in the sense of being able to read and write whole books and things like this, perhaps couldn't, do, could, couldn't write a word even. Uh, and, but that's because stories would have disseminated by you know, all sorts of different other means. They would have heard these stories, brought up with these stories, so, so, uh, and then formed their own opinions. Once the cat's out of the bag with a prophecy like Daniel, then you've, you know, you can free to interpret as you see fit. Um, in terms of moments, I, I mean, I, I am a, uh, some of these ideas are just there, and so they're ready to be taken up at any given time. I think in Galilee was a particular time that was conducive. Galilee is around the time of Jesus was particularly conducive. To, uh, uh, to these kinds of movements because there were some very, very significant changes happening in Galilee as Jesus was growing up. Uh, the building of Tiberius, the rebuilding of Sepphoris, which changed all sorts of kind of um, land patterns, ownership, people moving around and things like this. And apocalypticism becomes one avenue for discontent. But all these changes, a lot of similar kinds of changes are taking place in the first century and apocalypticism is the language of discontent. Whether you're a scribe or elite or where, off below, and you, these may be different interpretations, but there's, both exist, both coexist, I think. Okay, now we're going to take a question from uh, online. And I'm just put in the, uh, the question, this is a question from Sarah Rollins. And I'm putting it in my, own, in my own words as she's asking to do, but she's asking about the kind of amplified role of Jerusalem in the Gospel of John, and whether it's possible that instead of reflecting uh, the historical Jesus, this reflect this is basically a coping mechanism post destruction uh, between the author of the Gospel of John and his community, or however you want to phrase it. <coughs> that basically, that this is a way of them reflecting that Jerusalem is still very important to them after its destruction. That's... Um, if I've understood her correctly. Her um, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. I mean, Jerusalem continues to be important even once it becomes Elia Capitolina and then uh, in the fourth century when Constantine becomes the rebuilder of Jerusalem, which is a kind of messianic job to have, uh, and a Davidic type of job to have too. So that's, that's partly it. Why I was, um, why I was drawn to the, um, I mean, and John also emphasizes Jerusalem as, uh, at the holidays for theological and symbolic reasons. Uh, I'm not saying, I'm not saying otherwise. What I was trying to do is try to, uh, trying to look at the pieces on the desk and see what could explain, uh, how could Pilate possibly know that Jesus wasn't dangerous? And that, and the, the Johannine chronology jumped out at me because it was during the pilgrimage holidays that both Pilate and Jesus would have been in the same place at the same time. I think there's a question. Was there a question in the back? Did I, no? I imagine they don't. Sorry. Yeah, then, me. Uh, professor, uh, it seems that Jesus had very little commentary on social relations, on, on economics and business generally, on issues such as property rights or uh, so, uh, uh, sharing wealth. Is, does that chime with the view that his mission or the interpretation of his mission was that there would be, that was apocalyptic and that one needn't engage with social reform in light of a much greater event which was which would be imminent the return of the kingdom of god that's that's a very interesting question did everybody hear it um the, why is there no social program to uh the gospel material i think um You know, there is, there is a type of economic leveling that happens within the community that forms in Jerusalem. They are, um, that they practice a community of goods. 
And uh, one of the uh, aspects of Paul's letters that fits with that is that Paul's constantly collecting money to, to send it back also, which implies that they don't, you know, what are they doing with their time if they're not working? You know, are they, I don't know. Um, but I think in the, uh, I, th I think that there's an absence of a social program because the world is about to change uh, dramatically. And again, to, there's, there's a tendency to, I lived in Southern California for a few years. That was interesting. Um, there's a tendency to look at the, um, this type of prophecy as, uh, as irrational. Right. The the but when you think of their circumstances, this early community after the death, both before the the death of Jesus, but certainly after, they are getting empirical confirmation of their convictions by having uh, pagans join the movement, voluntarily relinquishing their native gods, by having uh, they're able to perform charisma charismata. They, they're able to speak in tongues, they're able to control um, lower class spirits, they're able to um, have inspired prophecies themselves. So there's, a, and this type of charismatic behavior reinforces the group, the feeling of the group. And um, in a sense there, and then Caligula would have been another shot in the arm for being confirmed in their convictions that it's God's clock is about to strike midnight because the idea of having a, an emperor's statue and the, that's, that's what, let the reader understand is the, is the cue to know that that's an apocalyptic thing. By the way, um, Josephus, who disavows this type of apocalyptic energy, comments on the, um, um, the standards, uh, the Roman troops on the t ruined Temple Mount sacrificing to the gods that are represented by the standards that the, uh, the troops carry, so in a way the prophecy did come true. There was a, an abomination of desolation where it shouldn't be once, once Titus controlled the city. Thank you for your questions. I'm sorry, could I ask you to treat this like an ice cream cone and talk right? That's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. Excellent. Um, you mentioned the traumatic death of Jesus on the cross and the traumatic death of Jerusalem in the city. I was wondering uh, how the concept of these events as trauma and violence either aid, either aid or hinder uh, your sort of uh, historical reconstruction. You just, dro you just dropped your voice as you were getting so, to your point. <laughs> Okay, with the traumatic death of yes, the city uh, and of Jesus. Yes, uh, the concept of trauma, how does that aid or hinder uh, our task as historians in sort of reconstructing uh, these traumatic events? Uh, uh, how does the concept of trauma sort of aid your investigation or hinder it? Um, I think that I think the death of Jesus is uh, was traumatic in the sense that it was initially a radical disconfirmation of a prophecy that could not be disconfirmed, and there that's the it's the trauma that feeds into the cognitive dissonance. Um, um, the trauma of the city is uh, of the destruction of the city is something that has a long echo chamber effect, and you get the Bar Kokhba revolt and 132, 135. Um, again, and then finally you get a disavowal of this type of, you know, we, we should really stop fighting the Romans, we keep losing um, kind of thing. So I think that type of, um, there's a, a long period of uh, refusing to recognize the reality of the, of the Roman Empire. Uh, and Bar Kokhba is, Bar Kokhba, if you're familiar with later Christian tradition, Justin Martyr, really, it's, it's at, after the Bar Kokhba revolt that Gentile Christians begin to read traditions about the first destruction and the first temple and use it as a description of Jewish contemporary life and uh, the beginning of a second, of a second exile. So there's, there's a way in which the, the the trauma of those events is repurposed in, um, in Christian apology as well because um, 
when people's fight, their gods fight too, and there were there were pagan um, um, pagan uh, comments about uh, the Jewish god having lost the war to the Roman gods, and that's something we hear in Tertullian. That's in Munitius Felix. So it's if you think your god's the biggest god. You have to explain why he was so that it's also a kind of theological, um, a, th a problem of theodicy, a, a problem of the problem of evil as well. So the trauma has quite a bit to do with it. Thank you. There were two. Uh, I know we have okay. several in here. We have two more here and one at the back at least. So do anyone? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll get you all. Uh, this one comes from Erin Roberts. She says she's curious about your comment that resurrection is grounded in Jewish apocalypticism. Could it not also be related to foundation myth type writing like the Romulus resurrection, which if I'm not mistaken is not associated with apocalyptic themes? themes. And if so, or if not, how do we manage non-Judean resurrection stuff? Um, I think people like the idea of people rising from the dead. I mean, you get, you get that, that trope in many different types of myth. I, um, fortunately, I don't do comparative resurrection mythology, um, but for the Jewish material, and specifically in the first century, you, you end up with a version of that being calmed down and domesticated in one of the main prayers that's still repeated uh, in the synagogue where you, you bless God for different things, and one of them is for, the, for restoring the fallen sukkah of David and also for raising the dead. So it's, it's, it's something that um, is, is fit in with the idea of political autonomy, um, freedom of religious practice, and, um, and the, when you think about it, when you think of all the, let's think about all the terrible things that happen in history routinely. If God is all good and all powerful, why is everything else like it is? I mean, apocalyptic eschatology gives God a second chance. And um, raising the dead is one of the ways that he gets that second chance. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> just, she, she was first. She's first, yeah, yes. just. <laughs> it was really close, okay. Or, or we'd like to think so. Well, like, well, I understand how you approach academia and your subject, but how do you separate faith from it? Because at the beginning of your talk, when you were talking about why did Jesus, why was Jesus crucified, I was screaming because God willed it. And because of... of God, it was God's will. Oh. He came to do the will of the Father. Now, so how in academia do you separate your faith and belief from your scholarship? And I know that's an impossible question to ask. Well, I'm glad you're not asking me any personal questions. That's, uh, um, what I'm in pursuit of when I do history is people. I want to understand the lives of these people whose lives were so different. I mean, 20 centuries ago, I mean, who of us has not looked at one's own parents and said, you know, how do they even think like that? And, I'm, and here we are trying to reconstruct something from 20 centuries ago. I, what, what drives me in my work is trying to realistically reconstruct the lives of ancient people. And it's in pursuit of that. I don't have evidence for what God does in history. And so many terrible things happen in history. I don't want to say, well, that was just God's will. I think, 
I'm a, I'm a free will type. And um, I think a lot of the responsibility for what happens in history is because humans decide to act a certain way. So um, in terms of the question of what's the religious dimension of something, I, I very self-consciously keep my focus on trying to understand the human evidence that I have. And uh, God and I have conversations between our, he doesn't answer back as much as I wish, but um, that's, that's something else. It's, it's, it sounds like it's a compartmentalization. It's not, there's a, a back and forth, but when I'm in the, in the hunt for a first century person, I'm, I'm focused on the person. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your time talk is about when Christians were Jews. I was wondering, what do you see as a transition between being Jewish and being Christian? And where does the idea that, that Jesus... In the first century? Yeah. I'm sorry, give me a time frame. In the first century. Yeah, in the first century. Okay. And uh, where does the concept of Jesus being God rather than the Messiah fit into that? <laughs> Did you plant five. people like this and then? Uh, thank you. No, no, no. Just, I'm glad you don't like small questions, do you? Uh, um, uh, this is where I kind of mumble weakly. Thank you for your question. Um, let's see. When do? When do? What's the transition between? When is a Jew a Jew, and when is a Jew a? Christian, Jew. Um, it de this sounds like such an academic dodge. Please believe me, this is what I really think. It depends how you define Christianity. And if you define Christianity as um, um, a belief in the divinity of Jesus, or if you define Christianity as something like the Nicene Creed, you have up until 320, 325 AD before you have um, a very highly formulated doctrinal body. I do know that there are, we get complaints in the fourth century of Jew, about by Gentile Christian grouchy patristic writers um, saying that there are Jewish uh, communities that believe Jesus is the Messiah but who are still circumcising their children and they're still keeping kosher and they're still keeping the Sabbath, so they can't call themselves Christian. And uh, I imagine the people who are doing that say, says who? I mean, what changes it and what makes certain faith definitions stick isn't the faith of these particular communities, it's the Roman emperor. And once Constantine decides to sponsor one particular type of Christianity, the first uh, communities that fall victim to his definition and embrace of the church are other Christians. So um, there, the definition of Christianity is fluid. And uh, I think that, uh, well now, I mean, in the modern period, n our, or the postmodern period, there are now Jewish communities that are also Christian as well, but they, they, they keep Jewish tr life traditions while also having a doctrinal belief in a high Christianity that, of course, isn't the same thing as what's going on in the first century. Have I been confusing enough to answer the question? Thank you. I mean. When does, when, is, when does Jesus become God? Is that, um, there's a, there is a terrific book called How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God? It's by Larry Hurtado. It's in paperback. It's available on one-click Amazon. I'm not getting a percentage from the book. But it's, that's, it's, that's a complicated and very important question, and it's too important for me to try to squeeze in an answer now. Thank you very much. Could you expand a bit on the role of the Dead Sea documents on this dialogue and on this argument of Messianism and apocalyptic literature? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, the, when I was trying to gauge the orientation toward Jerusalem and toward the Jerusalem Temple in different types of late Second Temple Jewish communities, <coughs> There was all the, I mean, Paul is very positively oriented toward the temple. The gospel traditions are positively oriented toward the temple. Um, John the Baptist has a positive orientation toward the temple. He's into purifications, and purifications are what you do when you go into a temple. Um, and the people who really were grumpy about the temple, who had what you could find anti-temple, were the Dead Sea Scroll people. But it turned out, the more I looked at it, that the Dead Sea Scroll people, it wasn't like they didn't like the Jerusalem Temple. They didn't like that other group of priests, the Hasmoneans, running the Jerusalem Temple. And a lot of their apocalyptic speculation is compensatory, because when God's last put out the light is spoken, then the temple's going to be run exactly the way the Essenes think it should be run. So it's still very important for the Essene community as, um, as well. In terms, of the, um, in terms of the motivations of the Essene community, I think that's again a, a place where prophecy is a politics by another. Yeah, they lost a power struggle between two priestly families. And um, a lot of the prophecies are compensating for that and talking about when they, when they take back control with an assist from angelic armies. And God, of course, wants the Essenes to be running the temple, or else the Essenes wouldn't be writing all these prophecies. Yes. Um, in Acts of the Apostles, um, it's that they say that the Christians uh, first class be called Christians in, in Antioch. Antioch. And as I understand the, um, the, the grammar in which it's written, it's unclear as to whether it was the Christians themselves that uh, developed this, mm -hmm. this name or, or whether it was those to whom the Christians were living. I wonder where you stand on that one. You just asked a question that's very hot right now which is when, when do these people begin? I mean, if you have a different name, that's one of the answers to the question, when, are, when do Jews become Christians? Um, all of the um, documents we have that use this term, um, Christianoi, is, uh, are from the early second century. So that if the Acts of the Apostles is written, nobody knows when anything was written, but if the Acts of the Apostles is written around between 100 and 110, a Wednesday. Um, <laughs> um, that also fits with Tacitus, where we have an occurrence of the word. It fits with the uh, epistles of Ignatius. And so it's, is that a word that, in, the, in terms of the narrative chronology of Acts, that would have happened in the 40s, but it's a word that we have no evidence for until around the year 100. Thank you very much. Uh, Ice cream, just like that. Okay. Yes, yes, very uh, so uh, I don't. I want to compare your book to James Crossley books. And <laughs> to who? <laughs> so, so that's the question for both of you, because uh, I think that if I'm not mistaken, that James argued that after uh, post conversion, it took him some time before he started preaching a uh, law-free gospel. Uh, sorry, uh, law-free gospel, yeah. So for example, before he uh, argued that, um, that Gentiles uh, need to <clears throat> stay, away, stay, stay away from the, being kosher and so forth. And I guess that you argue in your book, if I am correct, that uh, when Paul converted, there was already a mission. Uh, there was already a mission of, of apostles who who let Gentiles remain Gentiles, and they didn't require them to, for example, stay kosher. Is that correct? There's. I don't know of any Jewish tradition 
that makes Jewish ancestral tradition an obligation of non-Jews. The apocalyptic miracle was going to be when the nations turned from their own gods and worshiped the Jewish God. And remember, the Bible begins, and I can't say the Bible, because now it's between, it's this collection of books, right, between two covers. Um, <laughs> the Bible begins at Genesis 1, not at Genesis 12. So you, there's, there's no, I'm, if you think at Paul in Romans 9 listing the prerogatives and privileges of Israel, he lists the giving of the law, he lists uh, the cult of animal sacrifices, which is translated as worship in English, which sounds like a prayer service, but the word is litreia, it means cult. He's talking about God's doxa, his glory, which is a reference to the temple as the place where God, um, God dwells. All that Jewish stuff is the responsibility of Jews. It's, it was never, um, what's interesting is the only evidence that I know of, of um, people urging Gentiles to convert to Judaism, which would be the significance of males receiving circumcision in the mid first century, are Paul's opponents in Galatia. That we don't, so it's something that happens in the course of the development of the, of the different types of Christian messages in the mid first century. And at that point, the way I explain it to myself is that by the time we hear from Paul, the earliest evidence we have, mid-first century, the kingdom is already late. It's already 20 years late. So that's when you have people who are committed to this movement trying to figure out well, we must be doing something wrong. I know we'll try this. And that's sort of how I explain that. James, Do you want to? Yeah. yeah. There is a debate between us, actually, isn't there, in a recent, uh, uh, my response to uh, Paul's last book on Paul uh, and Paul's response to me in the, what's it called? A uh, Journal of the Jesus Movement and its Jewish study, JJM. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that one. Uh, which does discuss uh, some of these issues. But um, my, uh, my, my take on this is a bit more complicated than that. Um, it's that there were a range of people interested in Judaism, and this interest could go from yeah, aren't synagogues nice, aren't Jews all right, through to adopting certain practices associated with Judaism, and then full conversion might require for men circumcision and things like this. They're around to varying degrees or whatever. Uh, where I think, and I think it's probably in agreement here, I think, is that around sometime in the mid 40s, it starts to become an issue for this new movement. When you've got a number of people who are Gentiles, they may have had some sympathies with synagogues and things, but then they go off to, they've got their own networks and friendship groups and they behave in ways that would not have been perceived to be Jewish. And when you get so many people like this, what do you do with them? Um, I, I would put, bring in the eschatological argument there as well. I think it complements it, but I also think it's a quite a practical problem. Uh, and I think it starts to happen sometime, I would say, mid 40s onwards, but sometime in the mid first Because that's century. when the noise starts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's when we start getting the first evidence of this. Before that, I don't, it doesn't seem to me that it's an issue, a significant issue anyway. I mean, there may well have been the odd individual thing, but I think like, en masse it becomes a problem, whatever mass may have been at this point, but it becomes a, a problem mid-first century for Paul. And that's why you know, Paul has to do with all these issues and, and why you get the first instances of uh, people insisting on Gentile circumcision when you've got a precise situation where it's where it becomes an issue. Prior to that, well, it's not an issue. It just doesn't come up in Judaism for obvious reasons, I think. It's hard yeah. enough to get Jews to follow <laughs> Jewish <laughs> traditions. I mean, you're going to have to take them, right? Yeah, so, speaking, so on that note, speaking as a Jew, um, a couple of comments I'd like your comment on. The first is, when you read the Old Testament, this is back to a comment about wars between gods, the Jewish version is, the Jews were good, God loved them, the Jews were naughty, God, God punished them usually to another nation, who had other gods. So mm -hmm. that's my strong Jewish tradition. Mm -hmm. about. The second comment was that um, obviously the second death, the, the destruction of the temple, did yes. the Jews a favour because it got rid of priests. 
And we did late, it. got rid of priests. And we only have rabbis, we don't have priests. It's a big difference, you know. So we, we didn't suffer the priest craft which was in the infliction of... Well, except that you only had to deal with the priest if you went up to Jerusalem. If you yeah. want to deal with the rabbi, they were everywhere. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, sure, but they weren't priests. Yeah, that's, the, the, that's the, right. The, Some rabbis were priests, right. The question was about Vespasian. Yes. Now, Vespasian, I, I wanted to hear more about what we thought of Vespasian, because we have a history with Vespasian here, and I'm not talking about Jews, I'm talking about the English, because he was the guy that trashed the whole southwest of England and colonized us very extremely, and I wondered whether he brought his experiences there to Jerusalem in terms of what he did and whether you dug into his personality and his attitude to the recolonization of Jerusalem as he might have seen it. So two comments and a question. Okay. Did you dig into Vespasian? Um, I, I don't know about where else, what other neighborhoods he trashed. Yeah. But, uh, no, I'm, and I'm sorry he was in this neighborhood. Um, um, Romans, uh, if you think of how Romans ran an empire, they had very, very few people. And one of the ways they uh, ran their empire was, first of all, subcontracting to local elites, and secondly, by making examples of people who had other ideas. And that was, that was the vernacular of power um, in the first century. Um, you asked me something about Tanakh, something about... Well, about, and it's really about the peace craft side that is the most interesting, that, that the, the, the long-term consequences of what was done in the second death was a change in the nature of Judaism, really. Um, um, and, and did that affect your discussion about Christianity and Judaism? Um, the, the issue, everybody get that? The issue is once the temple is destroyed, the Judaism changes. Yes. It does and it doesn't because remember there are two enormous diasporas. There are Jew many more Jews living outside of uh, the Jewish home territories than inside, which means that Jewish populations for centuries had gotten pretty used to not doing anything at the temple. And uh, so that at a practical level, the destruction of the temple meant nothing to the day-to-day -day operation of a Jew living in Rome, for example. Unless, you know, it's very expensive. I mean, Philo is very wealthy and um, uh, lives right in Alexandria, which isn't that far from Jerusalem. He makes, he makes the pilgrimage once. Um, there's something else about the diaspora and the temple. Hold on. Oh, um, that's right. I, 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 with a colleague of mine at, at Hebrew University, I taught a course called The Fall in, of Jerusalem in Jewish and Christian Imagination great stuff. What happens in Jewish tradition is that the, and what happens in Christian, what, I mean, the Gospels are Jewish writings, but they become Christian scripture. Um, it's in the, what will become Christian sources that the, the sound of the fall of the temple is loudest first. And it's not until you get to the Bavli, the Talmud, uh, the Babylonian Talmud in the, in the fifth, sixth century, that you have a, a very loud lament about the temple. And so it's the, the longer the time lapse is from the destruction of the temple, the more the temple is, is mourned. So it's, I think there it's a, um, uh, something as complicated is going on with the symbolism of the temple. And I think it's a, Synecdoche for for homeland and for the end of diaspora. Is it tea time? It is. I was about to say. It's anyway. tea time. Isn't that lovely? Okay. <laughs> tea time is something say in the south of England, not in the in the north of England. It's more, tea time is food. <laughs> we're not having any of this nonsense here. <laughs> Um, we're going to cut off there and we're going to have wine time, which is far better than tea time in my view. Uh, but I think we should show our appreciation to Paul, not only for a fantastic talk, but she has actually been answering questions for an hour, is which is not <laughs> easy. Questions, guys. Uh, so please can we show our appreciation to Paul.